the current status of the relationship between Australia and China? What are the challenges that China poses to Australia's security? And are we living under China's shadow? Dr. Yuan Raha will address these questions as he discusses his most recent book entitled Australia's Security in China's Shadow with us tonight at AIIA Victoria. But before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land wherever we might be, in Dyson House or online, and thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Now I hand over to Dr. Yuan Graham. Good evening. Um, good evening, everyone. It's great to be back here at uh, AIA after a, a period of a, a few years. I was just chatting with um, Alistair Roth before the event, trying to work out when I was here last time round, and I think it was about about four years ago or thereabouts, um, just before I went up to uh, Singapore to start my job with the International Institute for Strategic Studies, uh, where I'm I'm still based, still still work for IISS but we'll be coming back to Australia shortly. Uh, but I'll go back next week for my effectively swan song event, which is the um, Shangri-La Dialogue, which is a big one for Australia this year because the keynote will be given by the Prime Minister uh, himself, Albanese, uh, and um, the Defence Minister, Richard Miles, will be up there as well. So um, that is a, an advertisement for um, the event to come. But... Um, Hopefully, there is a, a relationship between that and the subject of, of what I'm here to talk about um, today. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad to see a, a healthy turnout despite the weather. Um, the final, I, I, as you can see, the, the uh, sort of central metaphor is Australia's overshadowed relationship with, with China. And I use that. Um, uh, description in the context of what has been a, a, a rather tumultuous few years in the relationship after what was uh, earlier in the century seen as a very positive relationship. Now, I think a lot more um, uh, shades of grey to it. And um, the final line in my book, I was thinking of playing around with the image of shadow and uh, sunlight. And um, concluded that uh, the best antidote to an overshadowed existence vis-a-vis uh, -vis China is to embrace sunlight, uh, which I uh, called um, a commodity that's found in abundance in Australia, uh, but not in Melbourne in late May. <laughs> so I feel that was a bit of a hopeful uh, uh, image, but um, uh, I'm glad you've all um, um, turned up uh, tonight. So um, I came at this as very much as a, a generalist. I'm not a, I'm not a China watcher. I don't speak Mandarin. I'm not even an Australian. So you might ask me, what are my credentials to look at this uh, very freighted bilateral relationship? Well, the conceit, at least, was that having been here in Australia, very much part of the debate when a lot of the, uh, the, the tensions were really starting to... Uh, manifest in around 2015, 2016, when I was working for the Lowy Institute in Sydney as their director of international security and sort of living and breathing that, that palpable sense of, of, of change and unease. Um, and um, I can't say that I wasn't um, part of the debate. That, that very much was a lived experience. But going up to Singapore uh, was at a my attempt to really sort of gain some perspective on this, kind of out in orbit from Australia, China, and it's a very roused about debate, as I don't think I need to tell this audience. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, um, you know, heat and noise uh, that's, that's generated. Uh, some of it for good reasons, uh, some of it for, for less good reasons, and that I think has tended to distort the, the debate. What I wanted to do was to try and provide a, a bit of perspective and, and Distance was um, was the was the idea behind that to try and get a bit of distance and perspective, looking down, as it were, uh, on on the relationship uh, from my job uh, up in Australia in um, in Singapore, and one of the later chapters actually does try and do that in reverse and put Australia 
into a Southeast Asian context? How does the Australia-China dynamic play out within the region in terms of what Australia now likes to often refer to as statecraft, which is across the, the silos of uh, external policy? Um, but then I realized that uh, to start the story, you really, really need to look uh, at what happens in Australia. And I think this is a very obvious point, but I think it's one that needs emphasizing nonetheless, because I, I, I titled the first chapter, well, the, the first substantial chapter, which is looking at um, the uh, domestic debate, China policy begins at home. And I say that because I think there's no point for any country or any government really to talk about the defense of international principle or the rules-based order until really you're able to defend sovereignty at home. And I think that was the kind of key learning experience and test um, that played out in that period around 20, 2015, 16, when the Turnbull administration was in power and we saw um, a noticeable shift in how the government responded. And that primary test, I think, was played out in the, in the domestic debate. And there were public triggers around that. Uh, there were a number of uh, cases that, that got a lot of uh, media attention. And I think the role of the media was also very significant in pushing the concerns about political interference higher up the uh, agenda. It's not an easy thing to talk about. Uh, and uh, again, I think the conceit as an author was that being out of Australia gave me some license to be able to do that, at least in general terms, to talk about the themes of, um, of uh, Australia uh, and um, how it played out uh, with uh, the targeted campaigns on behalf of the ruling party of China, the um, Chinese Communist Party, to uh, deliberately cultivate influence in a way that I think was quite undermining of, of Australia's sovereignty. But I think there are broader themes that I also try and flag in that first chapter, which are about what's the, what's the role of China um, within the Australian foreign policy debate, because I don't think it's entirely seen as, as a, as a um, on its own merits uh, um, proposition. And what, what I mean by that is uh, Australia has had a long-standing um, debate with itself about identity. I don't concentrate on identity in the book, but Australia's role in Asia, which is very much, I think, a theme that the uh, uh, AIA engages on, uh, has obviously been um, very closely aligned to the question of Australia's relationship with China. And I think that China has at times played a kind of almost a proxy role within the debate as an alternative to the United States. I think a lot of the debate between Australia and China is in opposition to Australia's relationship with the United States. And it's not, that's not a relationship of equals, but I think there are, uh, there's a long-standing uh, tradition in Australian foreign policy to try and sink a, seek a closer relationship and identity with, with the region and to seek security in the region, not against the region. And China, I think, was uh, caught up in that uh, at, a, at a period when, um, obviously, economically, uh, there was a, a, a huge uh, impetus towards uh, expansion of trade. Australia was not in isolation to this. This was a, um, a, a, an almost unalloyed good news story as far as business and, uh, and government was concerned in the early part of the decade uh, when Australia was one of the clearest beneficiaries uh, of the boom in Chinese demand uh, for iron ore in particular, but for all of the things that Australia is known to, uh, to sell. And that was really the the theme of the, the follow-on chapter, which looks at um, Australia-China relations uh, in, in the crucible of the political economy relationship. Now, I'll, I'll admit to you, um, if I had been uh, diligent and completed this manuscript when I was supposed to, 
some point back in 2018, 19, I don't think there would have been so much shelf life to the end product because this was very much a moving target. Uh, frustratingly so, uh, I think there was probably two books worth in terms of effort to what actually came out because things were changing all the time. But if you're looking at the economic relationship, um, I think procrastination paid off in particular because uh, around 2020, there was a, a, a clear shift towards an economic campaign of coercion uh, from China to use trade uh, tools uh, for political uh, leverage. And I think that experiment was um, a very uh, interesting one to see again from outside. I was actually back here for part of that that time, and it was interesting not just simply to sort of talk in in terms of um, foreign policy elite debates, but I spent some some of that time in rural Victoria and talking to ordinary uh, rural Victorians about it. I thought was very interesting that they could see and, and sense the 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 the, the shift, uh, and I think. Um, that was very clear that that uh, uh, sense that that you know China had uh, China had been seen as a good news uh, um, open ended uh, proposition without real downside, and that was fundamentally under under question when the tariffs came down formally on on barley on wine and uh, in a variety of other sectors in a way that actually hurt people, cost people's jobs and livelihoods, and obviously that. That is a, a grassroots learning experience that then feeds up into the uh, political process. And we see some interesting divides there too. Big business, particularly uh, associated with the uh, uh, trade in, uh, in mineral, mineral commodities, has um, depended on the China uh, trade. And that has fed through into a story of, of, of growth for Australia. And Australia was the only OECD country that didn't go into a uh, recession after the global financial crisis. Clearly, there was a relationship uh, between that and the fact that, um, that trade was, was booming uh, with, with China. Um, but that, I think, also colored the political uh, terms of the debate. And um, there was some catching up to do with the fact that Australia, that China was not simply uh, a, an economic um, end user. Ultimately, there, there was a relationship to the government of China and to the uh, ruling Communist Party, and that in every uh, ultimate transaction, political risk began to insinuate itself. That, I think, was a key learning experience uh, for Australia around that time. But the fortunate part about waiting to uh, um, complete the manuscript is that the verdict came in. The verdict was pretty clear, I think, in the economic coercion campaign when it uh, uh, reached its course at the end of, um, you know, in, in 2021. Of course, it's not over yet. I should stress that a lot of those measures still remain uh, in place. But I, when I say it ended, I think the verdict was in that any attempt to sort of use that trade for positive leverage to gain uh, change out of policy in Canberra on questions like Taiwan or um, some of the other points that were inf infamously uh, listed in the 14 grievances that were uh, leaked to a, uh, a journalist in, in Canberra, and you can read about them in full in the, in the book. I'm sure most of you will know already um, that that, that uh, was unsuccessful. And that brought me to a conclusion that actually coercion was not aimed about trying to get Australia to jump into the, the China camp or be, become politically part of the, uh, you know, of, of the CCP's um, quasi allies. I think that was a, an unrealistic aim, even in Beijing's mind, uh, by the time uh, the Turnbull administration had brought in a, a set of, of uh, uh, counter interference uh, policies to defend Australia's sovereignty. But I think Australia has that uh, a, a demonstration value also within the region. And that's why I think of it more in terms of punishment rather than coercion. So coercion is to an, to an end. I think that the, the economic campaign on, on Beijing's part uh, to punish Australia 
was also to send a message to others in the region uh, to, uh, to keep in line, essentially. So I look then, um, at, this is a very broad canvas that I'm, I'm uh, uh, painting. And I think that the breadth of it, while it may look unfocused from, from some angles, is necessary because uh, China has to be understood as a policy actor. And when I was talking about China here, I, I am essentially talking about the Communist Party, that it operates in an integrated manner. And in order to fight fire with fire, it demands integration um, on the recipient side as well. And that's not easy for uh, uh, for any country, but particularly, you know, Australia is is a large country geographically, but in in population terms, of course, it's dwarfed by most countries in Asia. But the asymmetry is particularly great in in the in the, the view with with China, and I think that that is also a challenge for Australians to to grapple with. Um, that. Uh, that is a test of, of Australia's ability to lift above its uh, weight and actually to uh, take on the role of being a, a, an independent foreign policy actor uh, in the region and not simply to, uh, as a common critique goes, to rely on, on great and powerful friends, the United States, of course, um, being chief uh, amongst those. And I think that's also a, a kind of positive lesson from the, the whole experience of the last few years is. Australia had a wake up call and came to the conclusion that it needed to fundamentally defend its uh, its sovereignty on the basis of, of national interest and to stop worrying about angering uh, China. I think that was a, an important shift in national psychology and one that had to be um, absorbed at many levels, at the elite level, uh, as well as um, uh, at the grassroots level. I'm hopping around a bit, but to return to the, the defense um, chapter, again, procrastination paid. Why do I say that? Well, as someone who primarily covers defense and security in my day job, and that's been my uh, bread and butter as an analyst, Australian defense and security is, is interesting, but it's, it's never really been a mainstream concern beyond Australia. Australia's down or a long way away. And uh, that's also something that has to be borne in mind in the in the debate. And for a lot of the period in this century, Australia's main uh, involvement in conflicts has been in the Middle East and Afghanistan, plugging in so-called to uh, US-led coalitions, uh, in which that's often thought about as paying the premium of alliance. So not really a a, a fundamental security concern that's driving that other than the need to, uh, to maintain the alliance as, as the cheapest way of providing Australia's security, which I think is the case. But uh, that tended to dull the senses of threat perceptions in, of Australia within its own region. And I think for about 15 years, I can put a timeline on it, since about 2008, nine, there has been a, a growing sense within Australian strategic circles that uh, uh, China's uh, military buildup, unprecedented in peacetime since 1945, and its intentions as borne out by a, a claim on Taiwan, but also many other disputed territories with its, with its neighbors, which have become not to the point of armed conflict, but very close to it. And we have seen loss of life across the border, uh, the disputed frontier in, in India, uh, but maritime tensions in the South China Sea. All of these things were, were, were boiling up and asking questions. Could, was, Australia, was, was China really liberalizing? Was, Australia, was China becoming more like the West? Or uh, was it actually, was there another uh, entirely different, um, more ominous uh, process underway? And I think that percolated up to the point a similar timeline when those counter interference legislation was being rolled out in 2017 18 uh, in the form of uh, a, quite a significant shift in defense policy uh, that was formalized in something called the 
uh, defense strategic update in in 2020. I think that's the kind of the the the, the key pivotal point. Uh, and I think while China is not overtly uh, the object of of uh, that document, there is a bit of uh, um, airbrushing, let's say, of, of calling China out by name, but uh, references to coercion and anti-access denial capabilities leave little doubt, I think, as to what the, the real threat um, driver was, was about. And fundamentally, Australia had a realization that in terms of defense capability, there wasn't much in terms of deterrent strike capabilities. Australia was very used to plugging into these coalitions, uh, but not really to looking after its own security with the sense of, of a incipient uh, regional threat. And I think that under the pressure of those questions about China's intentions and growing capabilities, uh, there was a fundamental shift towards a view that Canberra needed to invest in capabilities that would provide a level of uh, deterrence uh, provided by, by Australia. Now, some may say, well, that's impossible because of the asymmetry of power. But I don't think Australia was or is uh, seriously planning for a, a, a bilateral conflict between China and Australia. It's, it's more really through the prism of the, of the alliance and other partners. And that's why I think the, the whole um, development around the Quad makes, uh, makes sense, even though that's no longer um, officially described in terms of, uh, of uh, balance of power or, or even defense policy. But it, again, it gets to this broader point about statecraft. But before you get to statecraft, the proposition was that Australia was not really uh, capable of providing a level of deterrence through its own independent uh, military capability. So starting in 2020, there was a clear shift uh, towards uh, increasing spending and in pushing that spending towards the acquisition of more missiles, more long range uh, uh, strike capabilities, uh, and particularly the replacement of Australia's diesel electric submarines, which has been an, an unhappy process that, um, uh, and I, I don't need to tell you what, what happened there, but I think 2020 was the policy point of departure, very quickly followed by the AUKUS announcement. Again, the same logic. It's basically about balance of power and leveraging the relationship with the United States and the UK to provide uh, strategic technologies and above all, um, access to nuclear powered propulsion as a way to give Australia that punch to be able to credibly uh, provide some level of conventional deterrent, not as a standalone capability, I think, realistically, but certainly in terms of how that uh, how that uh, combination of long range uh, strike capabilities and the ability to actually field and produce uh, missiles and what's often termed lethality in, in defense uh, language would um, would make a difference. And although eight submarines may not sound like much, but eight nuclear-powered submarines uh, with an appropriate suite of uh, long-range strike missiles, I think does make a difference. Uh, and um, that's why it costs $368 billion. But uh, we can get to uh, the nuts and bolts of whether, um, whether that's an appropriate investment in, in the question and answer session. But I think that the defense was coming, defense policy was coming together at the same time as we'd seen aggressive attention, intentions play out in the economic uh, uh, domain, and also a calculated attempt to uh, interfere in uh, domestic politics uh, in Australia. So these silos were actually inter interrelated, I think, through an integrated uh, set of, of policy challenges. And I should say one other lesson from the domestic um, debate is that Australia is a federation and uh, that is a source of strength in many ways, but it's also, it creates vulnerabilities through layers in governance and uh, autonomy to make policy up to some degree at state level that I think we've seen uh, China um, 
able to exploit with some clear examples. I think the Port of Darwin decision was, was also a very significant trigger. It, 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 um, it, it reached a lot of, um, um, it, it rang a lot of bells in Washington. We can debate whether that was actually a, um, uh, to what extent that was a, a, a live espionage threat, but I think the politics and the, symbol, the symbolism around it uh, alone is, is significant. And of course, closer to home here in Melbourne, we had the, the uh, Memorandum of Understanding on the Belt and Road signed by the Andrews government, which um, for all of the heat and noise around it, doesn't seem to have generated many benefits for the state. And it seems instead to have generated a lot of uh, aggravation between the state and, and, uh, and federal levels. And one might even say that might have been part of the rationale uh, on the uh, on the other side of the of the calculation, I've just put an asterisk there because when I sum up comments, and I don't want to go on um, too long, but I think that my final chapter was a, a proposition to try and gather all these threads together and make sense of it, not just in a domestic sense, but what's the what's the value of this looking at Australia? If you're an international audience, an international uh, readership, and the book is pitched not at an Australian audience necessarily, it is partly, but it's also there to, to, to ask that question. Uh, how, how valuable is Australia's learning experience for other countries that are going through a similar set of challenges? And I think that proposition uh, really does, does hold true. And um, certainly in, in, in the period when I was writing it, I think a lot of these, what are now sort of accepted as facts and truths about um, risk in the in the China relationship, were not, were not at all um, uh, certain. And uh, there has been a a learning experience, I think, in different tracks and different speeds across across um, all of the uh, uh, Western democratic countries, but also not just democratic countries, countries in Southeast Asia and the South Pacific have also been through their own uh, uh, learning, curve, learning curve. Australia is not a paragon, and I make that clear in the, in the book. Australia learns, like any democracy does, through a me rather messy process of trial and error, and um, there have been errors along the way, um, for sure. But I think the the bigger point is that um, Australia has often been first through the gate on some pretty um, important decisions. The decision around um, 5G communications was not just the first uh, in the region, it was actually ahead of the United States and the UK. And the UK, I think, was in a different mindset at that time. And that was um, debated at quite a vigorous level uh, between the, the two intelligence communities and, and governments. Uh, and the UK thought it had a balance in which they could allow some of that Chinese technology to, to still play a part within 5G. Um, but they have now wound back from that position. And the Australian uh, decision, which is rather gutsy, I think, to go for a, a effectively a ban uh, on Chinese operators back in 2018, has actually been followed by all of the, the Five Eyes intelligence par partners uh, and um, uh, many others since. In the final two chapters, well, sorry, the, not the, the final chapter is, is what does it mean for uh, as a model, but that's the statecraft ish issue I wanted to take up and look at where does this wonderful map I always love, uh, Southeast Asia and the Southwest Pacific. And this is part of the kind of redrawing of Australia's strategic map uh, back to, um, I mean, there's nothing new under the sun, right? So this is kind of almost back to, uh, you know, 1940s in some ways. I'm not saying that to over, over freight the expectation that we're moving towards a global conflict. It's possible, but hopefully we, we avoid that. But I think there's obviously a, uh, uh, an unparalleled challenge since that time when in that we have a, a rising uh, power and um, uh, Southeast Asia and Southwest Pacific are Australia's two key uh, neighboring sub-regions. 
and that's where Australia's influence is, is most likely to be felt. Of course, it projects beyond that. The construct of the Indo-Pacific is deliberately wide, I think, so that Australia is able to leverage on the relationship with Japan and India, which we've seen uh, currently with the visit of the, of the um, uh, Prime Minister Modi, in order to try and draw in uh, these other players to provide a, a, a balance of power. And, and Australia has been explicit that this is about a balance of power. But Australia's power is limited. It's a country of 24 million people. And uh, although it is um, uh, a significant actor and, and player, um, there are obviously limits. And I think that that's a very interesting test as to what extent Australia, where it puts its, its bets, because it can't be a, a, a bet e equally throughout the Indo-Pacific, otherwise that would, uh, it, it would fail. The, Australia just simply isn't, isn't big enough to do it. So where does Australia uh, concentrate in this evolving competition with China uh, in its two immediate regions? I sort of cut through to that. My, uh, my starting point was to, was to think that Southeast Asia was the more important of the two because it is bigger in terms of population, resource, and, um, and geography, one might argue, too. But the conclusion I reached is that actually the Southwest Pacific is where Australia uh, still has more influence where it can use its, its levers to greater effect. And although it is certainly playing a, a, a very um, challenging game of catch up, having neglected the region uh, as badly as it has for as long as it has, I think still uh, the Southwest Pacific is, is, is probably the more fertile ground for Australia um, in the competition with China. And, I think it's also interesting because that competition plays out in a more binary sense in the Southwest Pacific. Yes, the United States is, is more interested in, in and back there, but compared to Southeast Asia, again, it's often forgotten here looking up, but in Southeast Asia, they're also looking up and East and West, and Australia is often an afterthought, a welcome afterthought in some senses, but not the first uh, direction that uh, many countries in the region are looking to. So I think the value of, of Australian statecraft in the competition with China, Australia has to play in both. It's not an either or proposition. But I think in the Southwest Pacific, where we've seen China making very significant gains in influence over the last few, few years, is actually uh, worth the bet. And my observation of the new Labour government, which came in uh, with a, an announced priority to make Southeast Asia the, the priority in Australia's foreign policy effort, actually where we saw Foreign Minister Penny Wong travel more frequently and uh, earlier on was to the Pacific. I think in realisation of that fact, uh, once they were in and, and uh, really faced with the challenge of being uh, an incumbent, um, where, the, threat, where the, the threats to Australian interests could be most effectively counteracted, um, the Southwest Pacific, I think, marginally comes out ahead, but Australia also has to be um, present in, in both. Um, so I, I, I don't want to uh, delay any further before uh, question and, and answer. I just wanted to maybe just come out with a, a couple of con concluding uh, thoughts, which is um, in Australia, I think there is a sense that the China relationship is often seen in very bilateral terms, that Australians also need to look up and raise their horizons and make those comparison points themselves. Because it's on balance, I think, a good, a good uh, example that, that Australia has set. Messy though it, it's, that it, it may have been and incomplete though the, though the process uh, is. And not to see it in terms of um, only the United States alliance or the binary relationship with China. And I think that also plays to Australia's strengths, strengths to, um, to have the confidence to realise that um, the Australian case study is a valuable learning point on a global level, particularly in the region, but I would say at the global level. We see 
small countries in Europe, uh, very active ambassadors in Canberra who have also, I think, gripped this uh, this um, parallel. And um, that is, uh, uh, I think, a, a, a valuable lesson um, for Australia and a necessary uh, survival principle too, because I think only to focus on the bilateral relationship and to be uh, overawed, overshadowed by it to, in, the, in the metaphor is really playing to the... Um, the, the negative uh, and um, and in a way that um, uh, will enable the Chinese Communist Party to leverage Australia's fears and, and lack of confidence to its to its advantage. I don't want to demonize uh, China into the bargain. I do call it uh, um, a, a shadow. That is a, an emotive term, but I think that the clear separation in my mind is between the ruling party and the people of China who have the misfortune to be uh, led, led by that um, party in a particularly uh, author authoritarian um, phase of, of government without the, the choice uh, of, um, uh, of, of, of who rules them. Australia, of course, does have a choice in that, relation, in, in, in that relationship. And um, that's why I think that, uh, um, you know, the, the the, the learning experience is is continuous and and iterative, and um, it's not going to go away. There are no easy solutions. There's no point of victory in this. It's it's a long game, and it's going to be, I think, a, a dominant one uh, for the uh, rest of our lives. Um, but it's not it's not one that Australia should feel uh, intimidated by, or that um, one that there aren't good solutions except to seek an accommodation. Uh, I think the whole uh, evidence, particularly on the economic coercion side, shows that despite the fears that Australia couldn't find alternatives, that diversification wouldn't work, well, the market principle basically delivered. And uh, uh, there was no macroeconomic damage. There was, sure, there was sectoral damage on a significant scale, but Australia has weathered the storm in a macroeconomic sense the wiser uh, and better for it. And in fact, some of the rebuilding of the relationship that we are seeing now is I think China coming to the realization that on the economic front, at least uh, it picked the, the wrong fight. Ewan, thank you very much. Um, we'll come to quest questions in the room. We've got a roving microphone, so um, I'll just go round to Paul. First off, and then we'll back. So, if you could just um, briefly state your name and keep it to a, a quick question, we'll get through as many as we can. And there's a mic on the way. So Paul, first thing. Thanks, Ian. That was a, a great uh, tour d'horizon. Um, one thing you didn't mention as having occurred in the years in which you were writing the book is what happened uh, early last year, that is Putin's invasion of Ukraine and its implications for how we think about the prospect of conflict in our own region. Um, so without turning that into a long question, uh, I would just ask whether you would care to reflect on uh, how you see China's role in that context um, and our strategic decisions in terms of AUKUS as a hedge against what's just happened to Ukraine. Well, Thanks, Paul. Um, I, I think the war in Ukraine is is a geopolitical accelerant. Uh, it has um, brought back to the fore that major power conflict is a reality. Uh, and um, that's not just a notional comparison. The Russia-China relationship, although it's somewhat short of an alliance, there are tensions within it, but it's clearly getting much closer. And um, that really is the, the hinge of the, of the comparison between what's happening in Europe and, and the Indo-Pacific uh, and some of the parting words Xi Jinping to Putin himself for the benefit of listening microphones in Moscow. It was a pretty bleak message um, that was sent about uh, uh, that there were um, you know, changes on, not seen in a, in a, in a hundred years. Um, on the other hand, China, uh, I think, is not um, obviously best pleased with um, the course of events. Uh, there are com corresponding tensions in terms of its long-standing defense of, of um, 
territorial in, in, integrity. Caveat to that, not territorial integrity that China tends to cover in other places, but I think it, that is a genuine uh, point of tension between the invasion of Ukraine and um, and China's diplomacy on the global stage, where it's invested quite a lot in in trying to make itself seen as as the responsible uh, stakeholder, at least to the global South uh, audience. Um, in terms of Australia, well, Australia, I think, has uh, certainly started well on Ukraine by uh, making a, um, a pretty uh, generous material pledges to the defense of Ukraine. And I think that showed that it bought the conceptual link between Indo-Pacific security and European security. Um, that may be one area where the current government seems to be treading more cautiously because there, that initial line of material assistance seems to have dried up a bit. Uh, we'll know a bit more when Prime Minister uh, Albanese goes for the NATO summit in July, but he apparently needed some coaxing to be persuaded of the case to go in the first place. So um, uh, that is a is a is a, a work in progress. Elsewhere in Southeast Asia, to connect it to those two key subregions, it's interesting that the countries in the South Pacific seem a bit more energized about Ukraine and the negative uh, precedent it poses for small vulnerable states than in Southeast Asia, where I think, with the exception of Singapore, which had a clear line that this was uh, a point of principle about invading sovereign states, but others um, have either chosen to keep their head down because it's a long way away and they don't feel it as a direct challenge, or else, of course, Russian dependence on Russian defense supplies, which still, I think, has a major restrict constraining effect over not just India, but uh, Vietnam, and some of the other Southeast Asian countries. Thank you. Uh, I'm Christopher Lamb, and I'd like to follow on in part from that question. One of my main concerns, and I'm a part of the organization, is the Australian Myanmar Institute and that relationship. If there's one country which to me exemplifies the way Australia and China can find common ground over the future in a country, it is Myanmar. And it's hardly ever mentioned these days by politicians and not by you tonight when talking about Australia's security interests in Southeast Asia. So I'd like a comment on that. But the other thing I want to say is that what you say about Australia's security is for me a comment about an Australia of 30 years ago or more. Uh, the Australia of today is a country which uh, Modi's visit shows is a country with a very large population with origins in various parts of Asia. The number of people of Indian extraction in Australia now is almost as great as the number of UK extraction. This is quite a remarkable thing. And that to me shows there is a different character in terms of the assessment of Australia's security today than the one of 30 years ago. And with all due respect, I think a lot of what you said is out of date. Would you like to comment on any of that? Sure. Um, on, on Myanmar, I, I think Myanmar's not, it's not as if it doesn't have geopolitical resonances. Um, it's probably got enough geopolitical resonances to get it in trouble, but not enough so that people really pay enough attention to try and, and solve the conflict. It's sort of... It, We're on the wrong side of Australia for that discussion. But I don't think it is really a, a centrepiece in, in uh, US-China competition. Therefore, uh, it plays less less of a role in the themes that I'm uh, concerned with in, in my book. Uh, on the India question, well, sure, Australia's changed out of all recognition, and I think for the better. But uh, the point why India is interested in Australia is India also sees a balanced against a common threat perception. That common threat perception is China. Because however threatened Australia feels, it's going to be a lot less threatened than sharing a common border where there are a constant uh, loss of territory and loss of lives. And I think that India buys into the same balancing logic. And that's why that relationship, which has never fulfilled its potential, despite you know so many attempts to try and do so, is now coming together with the glue of a common threat perception against China. I don't mean that as purely military sense. I think there's a lot that um, India and and, China, and uh, Australia can do 
to provide options for the other countries. So I thought it was very interesting that Prime Minister Modi went not just to Australia, and didn't cancel his Quad meeting, but he took the effort to go to Papua New Guinea and preside over a, a, an India-South Pacific summit. And that shows that, a strip that India is, I think, going beyond the rhetoric of acting East. And again, it's doing so in the, in the logic that um, it, it is in a, a generation long competition with a hostile power to its north. Uh, thanks for a very interesting talk. Uh, Tony Hastings is my name. Um, you mentioned that uh, China's attempts at economic coercion against Australia were as much about um, uh, trying to influence or indeed intimidate other countries. I'm wondering from your vantage point in Singapore, how other countries, particularly in Southeast Asia, viewed Australia's response to China's attempts? Uh, it's a great question. Uh, and it's, it's an evolving uh, perception. I think at least initially, there was a sense that um, Australia was seen as too hot to handle, a little bit toxic because uh, it was pushing itself and asserting itself in a way that I think many in the region didn't feel sympathy for. They, they thought it was the kind of the classic Australian, um, you know, making a lot of noise uh, and, and bringing, um, you know, opprobrium down on itself, uh, which I don't think is fair. I mean, I think that there was you know, maybe some poor uh, communications discipline in the way that the previous government uh, would handle its relations on China. But I think uh, broadly, the, the policy responses were were correct. Um, but I don't think that a solution for Australia fits a Southeast Asian template. Uh, geography, culture, political systems are all are all very different. There are common learning points. So it's very interesting that, that uh, Singapore rolled out its own counter interference law in 2021, three years after after Australia. And maybe it wouldn't see Australia as a, a direct um, um, exemplar there, but certainly I think it was a very ref helpful comparison point. Uh, and um, with AUKUS, which I didn't come back to you on your question on that, Paul, so maybe I could combine the, 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 the two answers. But I think um, very often the case in, in Southeast Asia if there's a, a new initiative, it tends to attract a lot of, uh, of um, uh, questions and doubts to begin with. And then over time, it tends to bed in. And the point about bedding it in is that you need to have a very active process of, of briefing. Um, and I think we saw a sensible change in the way that Australia went about announcing its ch recent changes in defence policy through the Defence Strategic Review led by this government and exhaustively pre-briefing, post-briefing, visiting phone calls, some 80 phone calls, I think, the number I heard. Uh, and of course, to all of the countries in the region, in Southeast Asia, without, without exception. I don't think that could have been done for AUKUS. Just the nature of AUKUS meant the secrecy was unavoidable. And um, so I think Australia had to sort of cop some of the flack for that in inevitably. Uh, but the lesson was and uh, any change um, by Australia needed to be uh, briefed in a in a mode that made clear that Australia is not going out alone or going out with its old Anglo-Saxon mates uh, to the exclusion of the of the region. Because uh, if a balance is to be found, it has to be found primarily in the region. Extra regional countries can can help in that, and AUKUS is one good good example. Uh, but um, I think the governments. Uh, attention to Southeast Asia and it's also its learning curve on, on the Southwest Pacific shows that this, the real state, the, the real challenge is the statecraft one. It, it's getting your economic pillar and your diplomatic pillar and your defense pillar aligned and working together. And that goes so much further than the mantra of whole of government. Uh, it's very, very hard to do. It's very hard to do at the best of times. Uh, and um, these aren't the best of times. So Australia has is, is playing catch up, certainly came pl playing catch up for influence in the Southwest Pacific. Uh, but I think um, it's it, the, the, the trends are 
are, are, are positive. What, what I do slightly worry about, we're at an inflection point now with the China relationship, and I'm adjusting my own position, coming back here and spending time to try and get a sense of where we are. And um, I think while the broad policy settings in defense uh, and security aren't going to change, they're the easiest ones to, to sort of maintain continuity on. The harder ones are trade, because trade's all about deal, deal making in any way. So I think the tendency to want to sort of go out and get ahead and make an accommodation, some of the bad old ways are having to be fended, fended off again. Thank you. Um, you started your presentation by saying that you wanted to remove yourself from Australia as well as China so that you could see it from a probably more helicopter view. Uh, I wonder if it is enough to go just to Singapore and West Pacific. Uh, to what extent does your book look at the matter from a very global point of view and also major power struggles at the moment because it seems that there are arguments that the power is changing from the west to the east and if you put all of your uh, prepositions through that filter how does it look because given Australia's size and abilities is Australia actually projecting herself uh, and her focus in the right direction or not, because the threats might be quite different to what we might be seeing from that perspective. Well, it's a challenging uh, question. And um, it reminds me of the earlier question about Ukraine as well, which is it's the same same issue. Should should Australia put its uh, effort into a, con into a, a conflict where there is no direct military state, but clearly there are principles at, at, at stake on a on a global stage. Um, I, I think Australia is, as a as a you know, middle sized country, always well served by multilateralism. That's that's a kind of that's a, a staple of Australia's uh, foreign policy uh, making, uh, and therefore I think. Um, you know, the role of institutions like the WTO which operate at a global level are worth defending for, for Australia. Uh, because if if things shrink down to spheres of influences and deals between uh, countries on a bilateral basis, Australia is always going to end up or usually going to end up on the on the, um, the, the shabby end of that of, of that deal. And that's essentially what we're seeing China trying to do to use its size to to uh, coerce. Uh, its other uh, partners into into line and making conscious parallels between uh, political asks and economic uh, demands. Um, and that, I think, there is a global balancing element to that. So the role of European countries, although it may look like yesteryear to some, is important. I thought it was significant that the UK, although it's it's a much less powerful country than it was 30, 40 years ago, Deserves its, its own bullet point in the in the defense strategic review, and it's it's also I think it's been forced to raise its own risk and view of the world because um, of the uh, break in break in the relationship with the European Union. But the 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 glass half full of that for Australia is that you've got countries in in Europe that are showing more interest here um, in this region for the reason you said, basically the the center of global economic gravity is moving to the Indo-Pacific, and that's not going to change. That's not going to... Uh, well, that's that's the conundrum. It's uh, it, it, it's opportunity, but it's also threat. Yeah. Sure. Hi, my name is Lottie Van Wyk. Thank you for your insights tonight. I was just wondering if you could speak to the fast tracking or how the shift between the Australia-China relation in light of climate change and the very maybe more proactive um, position with China versus Australia at the moment. Thanks, Lottie. I, I don't mention climate change very much in, in, in my book. Um, Look, I, I think it's it's that's not to belittle it as a as a as a policy challenge for for the whole world, but I think China will make its own 
um, climate change policies based on its own interest. It won't make them because that's part of a broader deal making offered by by uh, Australia or, or the United States for that matter. Um, so in that sense, it, it's probably best dealt with on its own on its own merits instead of trying to shoehorn some geopolitical linkage that I don't think will, would really stand up in in Beijing. Um, it probably helps more in the relationship with the South Pacific countries in particular, because in their paradigm, climate change is an existential concern. That was certainly a point of ten tension with the Morrison government. So the fact that the current government uh, embraces more about the climate change uh, message has, I think, um, eased the obstacles to a, a, a better relationship with uh, the, the Pacific Island countries. Thanks, Ewan, for your big picture view, helping us to understand the bilateral relations with China in relation to other issues. My question is this. Um, it does seem that this government has made an effort to brief other countries in the region about its intentions, particularly around the defence, or is it the strategic review and um, other recent issues. <clears throat> I have the sense they're not briefing the Australian public quite as well. And so that when a public figure like Paul Keating speaks out, there's kind of, there's a hollow echo chamber in which it bounces around with very little response from anywhere that's you know plausible. And it strikes me that um, there's perhaps too little attention being paid within Australia to explaining the rapid shifts, particularly in defence policy. I think the, the interference one, that was widely understood. There are a couple of very public cases. Everyone got the message. Um, but in, in relation to defence, why this, why that, why this choice? It seems to me sometimes people are a bit amiss. And it's very, very easy to those who have a, a simplistic historical view of this to counter that position. Well, um, I should start, John, by thanking you also for your input to, to my book. Um, I reference you several times, and uh, you're, you're a mainstay of the of, of the um, of the debate. And I hope I hope you remain um, active in it. I think that um, you raise a fair point around um, transparency generally on China policy. I think on the defence side. I asked the question of Richard Miles up in Shangri-La um, last year about transparency, and he ran with it, maybe unsurprisingly, but he said he'd make transparency a watchword of his term in office. I think one payoff of that is the defense strategic review language on China is clearer, and it doesn't, it doesn't um, pull away from naming China uh, in, in, in you know, pretty uh, um, threat-based terms. Uh, in, in a way that the defense strategic update two years ago didn't do. So that's an advance. Um, it may be a, a, a small um, uh, advance, but I think it's in the right direction. On the broader questions of China policy, I'm not so sure that there is that transparency. I think there is still a tendency to be very cautious. And in fact, the caution seems to be uh, affecting other relationships. The Taiwan relationship is one bellwether, I think, of Australia's confidence to explore flexibility in relation to China with other, with other partners. And I think the tendency to view China only as a kind of subset of the, of the, of the China relationship and as a, as a problem set rather than an opportunity set uh, is, is something that will require a, a lot more effort and time to to overcome. I'm not sure that the current government has really uh, uh, gripped that. I think they're too set on re, re, you know, restabilizing the relationship at the moment. And the fact that um, China has dangled a, a visit to the prime minister so publicly uh, early on is, I think, also a risk because um, the, the, the problem is that once you have that risk, the, the a public commitment to get the prime minister to Beijing, that then often becomes the glide path for policy in other areas. And it, it just tends to uh, reinforce the, the uh, risk aversion mindset and, and not stirring up things that might anger China. And I think we've certainly seen that in the domestic debate. Um, you mentioned Paul Keating. I, I, I do think Australia has a Paul Keating problem. And I think that the Labour Party probably has a particular Paul Keating problem because some of his comments, not just on China, but basically uh, trashing other partners in the region, uh, Japan and India, 
uh, I think is, you know, it, it's, um, uh, you know, it's damaging. And I think it, it needs to be uh, uh, called out because, um, uh, you know, I, I, I think that that would be a, 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 a significant step forward to uh, resetting the domestic settings of Australia's uh, China policy because he is such an outsized uh, influence. On the other hand, he's not, um, you know, I think there's no suggestion that uh, Keating has uh, influence, direct influence on policy, but the fact that he's still there with that stature, making statements publicly as, as he does uh, in very emotive and unhelpful ways, I think is, is uh, uh, a challenge for, for everyone to agree. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, um, yeah, unfortunately, on that note, we've we've hit our allotted hour, so um, I think we'll have to to wrap it up. Um, feel free to, to to come and have a chat in a second, but please join me in thanking you. Thank you for all the work you've done on your your book, and I'll remind um, listeners here in Dyson House and those online. The QR code is up there. There's a there's a twenty percent discount using the code valid till June the eighth, and Given also your work on Shangri-La Dialogue, thank you for reminding us that's coming up on the 2nd of June and Australian Prime Minister keynote address, Richard Miles there. So a lot of attention, very timely talk. So thanks again very much for, for coming. Thank you. Thank you.